Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Bonnie Murray, one of the Education Specialists at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. And I'm delighted that each of you is here with us today for the first, the kickoff, the inaugural session of Ask Nice. This will be a monthly series. Each month on the third Thursday of the month, we'll be getting together to bring you information to strengthen your content knowledge on Earth system science topics, and we will be providing you with resources to infuse into your curriculum to teach those topics. All of this, of course, is brought to you by the NICE program, NASA Innovations in climate education and let me share that image with you. Many of you if you're watching through the live stream went to the um, website to be able to connect to us today so you're familiar with that logo. I want to highlight also while you're on the website please do look around a bit there's quite a few resources there that I think you will find helpful. One of which is the TRACE catalog, the Tri-Agency Climate Education catalog. It contains resources not only from NASA but from whoops, from um, the other projects, yikes, excuse me, <laughs> it contains projects from uh, National Science Foundation and also from the uh, NOAA, National Ocean uh, Oceanography and Atmospheric Association. So please check that catalog as well. We have several sites connected with us live today, and I want to welcome each one of those into the Google Hangout. So let's see, let's start with um, Bill and Bob, are you connected? Can you say hello? I see some teachers over there. All righty. Yes, Bonnie, we're on. All right. So Bill and Bob are connecting from the Lake Country Distance Education Center in Mecklenburg, Virginia. And for those of you who are not familiar, that's pretty far west over into Mecklenburg, correct, Bill? Yes. <laughs> okay. And welcome to the teachers who are gathered there. We also have the Institute for Advanced Learning and Research and that is in Danville, Virginia. And Dana, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> Hi. There we are. So Dana's saying hi. And some teachers are gathered there. Hello to the teachers Hello. there. Welcome. And then we have a local connection as well. We have Erica Deal. And Erica is connecting from the Mariners, the Mariners Museum, Museum, which is which in, in Newport News, Newport Virginia. News. Pretty close Pretty to close us to in us Hampton, in Virginia. Virginia. So hello, so Erica. Hello, Erica. Hi. And hello. Erica, there's a very special guest at your location. Right? There is. Right. The nice, the program, nice manager, program manager, Monica Barnes, Monica is at that location. Is at that location. So, Monica, so I'd, Monica like I'd like to welcome you and let you, you, say, you say a few words. Oh, thank you. I just like to welcome everyone to the series. We're very excited about the series that uh, Bonnie and the Virginia Space Grant Consortium have put together, and so we're really looking forward to all the participation from all of the various uh, participants throughout the country, and we're just excited about what you guys are going to learn. So have a great time. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Monica. And as Monica mentioned, in addition to these sites that we have connected live with us, we also have participants from throughout the country that are connecting through the live stream. So for those of you who are connected watching the live stream on YouTube, I want to remind you that you can submit questions through the comments box. So on your viewer, you should see right below the viewer, you should see a comments box where you can type in questions. If it's not there, you might need to expand your window and, and, and open that up at the bottom. In addition to the comments window, you can also use Twitter, and if you'll include the hashtag AskNice in your tweet, you can send it through whatever Twitter account you have, and uh, we are watching for those tweets to come in, and we will answer your questions at different points during the broadcast today. All right, well, without any um, more time taken with that then, let me go into our uh, first presentation. and. Um, the bad news here is that the presenter who was going to share this information with you um, had an emergency come up and is not able to be with us here today. But Peter Schmidt, 
uh, it does a program called Into the Woods. He is one of the NICE principal investigators, so he's part of the NASA Innovations and Climate Education Project. The good news is the work that he does is work that I have done a good amount of, and so I'm going to share his slides and the resources that he has um, in lieu of him being here with us. And if you have any questions uh, that I can't answer, we can certainly uh, get those questions out to Peter. So the Into the Woods program uh, is done, as I said, by Peter Schmidt. And, oops, let's see, yeah, there we go. Uh, what I wanted you to be able to see is that Peter is working from New York City doing this program with students. So when you think of New York City and the urban jungle, you don't often think of a, um, a situation where you have a lot of woods and green area. But Peter finds green areas around schools to be able to take students out to create a laboratory on the school grounds. Uh, as I said, Peter is working from Queens College in uh, Metropolitan New York, and he's using the GLOBE program. So let me pause here for just a second. How many of you who are connected with us live are familiar with GLOBE? Anybody use the GLOBE program? Yay! Okay, that's wonderful. And I'm looking at the other sites. Any hands raised there? Okay, well, if not, this is going to, going to be a really exciting resource. I see one person at the Mariners Museum saying, yes, they've used them. Great. I know up oh, two people. Excellent, excellent, good. I know that Marilay, oops, and I forgot to introduce Marilay, didn't I? She's laughing. Okay. So I hope that's the worst I do today. Marilay is my dear friend, and if I had to, uh, to make one mistake, I'm glad it's with my dear friend. Let me stop for a minute and introduce the second presenter that you're going to see. So Marilay, would you say, let me stop sharing. Okay, and let me give Marilay a minute to say hello. <laughs> so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Marilay Colon Robles. And my, I'm also an education specialist, just like Bonnie, but I'm connecting to you from NASA Langley. So thank you all for joining us, and I'll talk to you all in a little bit. Thank you, Marilay, and my apologies again, yes. Marilay and I work together closely on many projects, and Marilay, what made me think of her at that moment was, Marilay has done extensive work studying the GLOBE program, so she's very familiar with that. I'm a GLOBE certified trainer, or not trainer, GLOBE certified teacher as well, um, so we're very familiar with that program, and Marilay will be bringing you information later in the broadcast. Thank you, Marilay. All right, so let me go back into Peter's slides here. Whoops. There we go. Okay, I want to share a little bit of this information um, because I bet you're finding out, I know some of you who are connected with us in the uh, live sites there are not only teachers but science education leaders, you know, you're the science education um, leader at your, in your district. And a lot of times elementary teachers are not trained in inquiry science methods or they're, uh, or, and or they're not trained in a great deal of science content. So when it comes to authentic ex uh, science experiences for students, they often tend to leave those out. And certainly that's not true for every elementary teacher. Uh, but that's a pattern that we sometimes see. And Peter did see that that pattern was evident in the teachers he was working with. Many of the teachers were just afraid to go outside or there, were, there was reluctance on the part of the administration for taking the students outside. And I know I personally experienced this myself um, just down to the fact that some of the teachers or some of the administrators were suggesting that I was bringing too much. We were tracking dirt into the school, you know, we were that kind of an issue. But a, the larger issue was, was that instructional time valuable? Why was that instructional time valuable? So I'd like to ask some of the sites that are connected with us. Um, first, with a show of hands, are any of you experiencing those kind of issues in your school? Okay, how many of you take your students outside? 
Okay, so that would largely explain why you're not experiencing those issues. So we're going to hope to change that. Now I see somebody over at <laughs> I see somebody over at the um, Lake Country Center. Do you want to comment on the kind of uh, challenges that you're facing when you try to take students outside? Would you like to say a few words? Thank you. We really didn't experience any challenges, but we did do a field uh, work site program at John H. Kerr Dam with two middle school groups of students. We went four times to investigate water quality, so that was an authentic problem um, that the children investigated, and it was just a wonderful collaborative experience with a um, federal partner and the school district. Excellent, and I'm glad you brought that up. Having a partner to work with you as you create your outdoor laboratory is an excellent idea. So tuck that away um, as one thing that you'll want to put in place as you work towards this. So any other comments from any of the uh, sites from Mariner's Museum or from IALR, the Institute for Advanced Learning and Research? Okay. We find it. You know, okay. the, the inquiry to be really to be really original when the kids can take a simulation and test outside after introducing elements like you know uh, air resistance, wind, and, and other gravitational factors, um, so they can see it done on a, a simulator versus um, in real life to see what the different data how the data uh, differs between the two. Great, that's an awesome comment because Great. a lot that's of times. Awesome comment because a lot of times. I'm going to let you mute there first. I'm going to let you mute there first. Okay, thanks. A lot of times when students are watching simulations, they're not even really clear that this is an actual data representation. So tying the collection of data to a simulation that they're watching would be a great way to handle that. So thanks for that comment. All right, let me go through some of the pictures. Whoops. No, maybe not. Yes, I'm hoping that I am screen sharing, but things aren't moving for me. Okay. So I want to go through, there are some of the partners. We mentioned partners, and you'll probably want to find some local partners as well. Okay, and this is focused on authentic science. You're going to create, the goal is to create a laboratory on your school grounds where students are able to observe, and I'm looking right at the bottom there, observe and ask questions and design research projects. Authentic science. Ah, let me not skip over this. This is the reach, and remember again, Peter's in New York, in New York City, and he's, able to, he's been able to work with 2,300 teachers from 750 different schools. So I feel confident that we can help you to get this working in your school, and I hope that we're able to move forward and do that. All right, I want to move forward and show you some of the pictures here. Because these are some of the before and after, and I'm going to show you the Elementary Globe program as well. And don't be afraid of elementary. It also can apply to uh, higher grades as well. But the students were really involved in all aspects of science. When we're teaching science in the elementary and middle school classroom, sometimes it's easy to have science become what we know and not how we know it. And this is a great way to let students experience how we know what we know and learn both of those components simultaneously. So students are involved in creating uh, items to express what they've learned and the content pieces. And I'll show you where they're getting this content from in just a minute, the hummingbirds. Students outside, uh, someone said something about water quality testing, so there's the students outside doing that water quality testing. Mm -hmm. okay. And I want to skip all the way to the end. There's Peter, first of all. So you're not getting to meet Peter today, but there is Peter in the classroom working with the students. And, and hey, Bonnie. Yes. Yes. Um, do you have an alternate sound in the background? Because we're getting. Oh, you we know what? We can hear oh, the wind chimes. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and it's probably cutting out my voice. So thanks for letting me know that. 
Uh, the compilation and analysis of data, data is the focus here. And one of my favorite parts here, making sense of the finding and like real scientists, sharing the information. So the report out is a significant part of that as well. So are any of you thinking, I'm hoping you are, let me get some comments from you. Are any of you thinking of places that this could fit in your curriculum? I'd like to talk about that for just a minute or two. Where in your curriculum could you use an outdoor laboratory? So I'm going to mute my mic so that when you uh, unmute, we'll be able to hear you. In my school, we're, we're grades 6 through 12, so in earth science, life science, and as well as physics and, and chemistry, I mean, all the sciences you use an outdoor classroom. There's always something in there for all the sciences, and so um, I'd be remiss to say that we couldn't use it. Hey, Bonnie. Hey, it's Bonnie. It's yes. Hi, Sonia. Yes. Hi, Sonia. Um, we, of course, are right on the river, and so we do a lot of outdoor science, but of course we're not a school, so we have a lot of schools that come to us to do this sort of thing that support all aspects of their curriculum depending on what grade level we're dealing with. So I've been trained in one subset of GLOBE. I don't know if they've changed the way they do it, but of course we didn't have a report out element because we have kids, all different kids come to do a, a single thing, so we don't have that continuity that a teacher has. And I don't know if GLOBE has a way to accommodate that. So thanks, Sonia. Those of you who don't know Sonia, um, since she has spoken and answered a question, let me uh, tell you about her a little bit. She works at the Danville Science Center. So that brings up another neat connection. You may find a science center near you that has some equipment that you can use if you need to find someone to uh, tie that into. And yes, GLOBE has a variety of protocols and we can review them. No, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take time to do that right now, but GLOBE has a variety of protocols uh, that would fit many different SOLs and standards. So I want to go through a couple of places that I know I use this with my students because once I took them outside it was time consuming and I wanted to make sure that I taught as much as I could from the data and the information that we collected. So teaching about the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, chemical versus physical change and uh, the whole decomposition aspect, watersheds and soils were all places in my curriculum throughout the year that I could use the data that we collected while we were outside. So let me go to, I think uh, this might be a good time to show you the GLOBE site and show you, okay. So you'll see here that there are a variety of books that are used and this is part of specifically of the elementary GLOBE program. And so if you just Google elementary GLOBE, you'll be able to see these. And you'll notice that, for example, there's a book on the water. Whoops. I'm switching there. Discoveries at Willow Creek. So that's one that you could use with your uh, studies when you're outside at the water. And what happens is there are activities that are done before you go out and then after you go out. And the book can actually be shared. You can print them if you'd like to. But the book can actually be shared via the computer, via the Internet and you can uh, work through the book that way by displaying that to your student. So five different books all about the earth which ties together earth system science. The clouds, talking about the clouds and how they're part of earth system science. We talked about the water. Mystery of the missing hummingbirds which ties in phenology and then the scoop on soils which would touch on your soil elements. So we can explore that in greater depth at another time, but just uh, Elementary Globe is a great program to be able to use there. So I'd like to suggest one other thing. While you're um, taking your students outside, another place to add technology is in your outside laboratory. 
And using a GPS unit would be a great way to do that. Do any of you currently use GPS units? And you can just show of hands, let me know. Okay, if not, GPS units can be obtained from your local 4-H center. So you have a 4-H center somewhere near you, probably, or your local 4-H agent can get them for you. It's also an item that you might be able to get um, a sponsor to purchase for you or to provide. Um, lots of different places that you can get the, the GPS units. And the GPS units would allow you to add technology into your curriculum. I also want to mention the Globe books that I showed you allow you to bring science into the language arts curriculum. So talking about crossovers and ties, um, you could use these to bring literature into your science curriculum, but they are actually written to allow you to bring science into the language arts curriculum. And that's significant because a lot of schools are cutting out the science time. So this would allow you to uh, use the language arts time to teach science. So along with that, using the GPS units would be a great way to go. And can you think of anything you could do with the GPS data? If you did have GPS data, you collected it, what could you do with it? Any ideas? Any ideas? You can, you can upload real data into Google Earth and let the kids see it. I couldn't be happier couldn't you be said happy. that, but I want to let some other people answer and then I'll come back to Google Earth. Anybody else? Okay, we'll go with that thought then. Google Earth is an excellent tool. It is pretty bandwidth rich, so uh, it can be a bandwidth issue, but if you're able to use Google Earth, it's an amazing tool to teach. And I would suggest that you partner up with some of the other teachers in your school, the math teacher, the social studies teacher, because they will find application for that Google Earth as well, and that will allow you to tie some different curricular areas together. And what's wonderful about Google Earth is you can, of course, put the lat long right into Google Earth, and then you can zoom out. Because as you do that, you're able to not only study the 12 by 12 plot that is your school laboratory, but you're able to see how that plot fits into the larger picture of the land around it. And that's a significant part of Earth Systems Science. So with, with that thought, I'm going to switch over to Marilei who we told you would talk to you a little bit later. And the first thing, Marilei, I think we should probably check and see if there are any questions that have come in that we need to answer. And then we can get back to that thought of zooming out on Google Earth. Sound good? Um, so, Bunny, I'm, let's check. Uh, have there been any questions? So, no questions so far, Bunny. OK. OK. Uh, we do have an interesting question on the Q&A about space, commercializing space, but I think we can touch on that a little bit later. Okay. okay. All right. Unless well, you want to answer it now. That's no, fine. I think what we might want to do is, are there any questions from the sites then? Since we have not had questions that we need to go answer externally, are there any questions from the sites on the information that I've covered so far before we switch over to Marillet? I went through the training for uh, Globe, and I know it was preferred that the training start when the trees start budding for uh, budding um, data. But could you start it in January because of four by four scheduling? Could you be as effective as if you started in January or the beginning of February and not waited for um, early spring? Yes. So two thoughts on that. First, that specific training starting at that time, I believe, was related to the Bud Burst program and the green up and the green down. So there are, as I said, many other, I really don't know, I want to say hundreds, but I don't think it's quite that many. But there are many protocols within GLOBE that you can study that would not be season sensitive. So for example, if you wanted to do a hydrology study, you might want to do that over several seasons. But you wouldn't need to wait till any particular season to start on that. Right, okay. as well as the clouds. It would be interesting to also look at the types of clouds starting in January when you're kind of in the middle of uh, winter and then see how the types of clouds and precipitation change as the semester continues. So that's another protocol you can really start 
at any point during the year. And then I also want to mention, thank you, Marile, um, that we will be doing a session, the Ask Nice session in January will be on Green Up. So we're getting you ready to be able to do the Green Up right when it starts in the spring. So if that particular protocol interests you, that is one that we'll be doing. Okay, but yeah, as Marilei mentioned, the clouds are a good one. There's uh, an atmosphere one dealing with ozone uh, that you can work with, and, and they would not be temper or seasonal in nature. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Anything else Anything from any else? of the other sites? Okay, well then let's turn things over to Marilei and we'll go back to that thought of zooming out from your plot, your uh, laboratory on your school grounds to looking at a, uh, a picture a little further away from the site. Marilei, thank you. So thank you. So talking about um, Google Earth is a great way to introduce technology and look at the space that you're working in. Working in. Um, and there are a few features on Google Earth that you might want to take advantage of as well while you're using it to look at the area that you're studying. So like a park near your school, then you can zoom in, you can use the GPS to get your Latin log, and then use Google Earth to look at it in a, in a, in a better, um, better way. So let me share here. So here's just a picture that I got of a park right next 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 here to Nessa Langley, which I like to go in with my daughter and discover the leaves and look at all the phenology and the animals that live there, right? And just a few features that you can uh, use. Here on the top, you can pan and look at north, south, east, and west. So maybe if you do have an opportunity of putting maybe a um, anemometer or some way of measuring precipitation or anything like that, uh, weather related, talking about some of the GLOBE protocols. You can also use this to look at where north is pointing and what's surrounding that instrument or just surrounding the area um, where you just collected the data. Um, and then in the bottom, that's where you see the lat and long latitude and longitude, but then you also have altitude. Okay, so when you zoom out, then you can compare, you can look at the altitude and then compare what you can see by just increasing that height. So now I zoomed out, okay, and look at everything that's around that park. I don't know if you can notice, but there's a little red dot and that's where that park is. Okay, so just by looking at the park zoomed in, you might think that it's all nice and green, but when you zoom out, you can see that's really in an urban area. Okay, so this is really good. Um, you can tie it in also to uh, ask, asking the kids to ask their family members or neighbors how things have changed over time as they live there in that area, you know, so they can compare it to what they see now. <clears throat> so how are these images taken? Okay, because kids sometimes think that this is an artist's rendition, right? But this is actual data. And how do we obtain this data? I see one of the centers. Any ideas of the instrument that we use to obtain this data? No? It's a word that starts with an S. So think about that zoom in, zoom mm -hmm. out. What kind of instruments do you use when you're collecting? Maybe a thermometer, maybe a um, a, uh, a, a tool that you'd be digging soil with. They're the kind of instruments that you're using close up. What kind of instruments are we going to need when we zoom out and want to get a larger picture? Uh, 
Satellite. Very good, satellite, right? When you look at maps and Google Maps or Google Earth, that's all satellite data, okay? Of course, they wait until there's no clouds and everything, but if you can zoom in almost uh, until you can see your car parked there, right? Because they're constantly taking pictures. So they're actual data and taken by satellites. So how would you describe what is a satellite? In your opinion, what is a satellite? So the question was, what is a satellite? So the question was, what is a satellite? It's, it's a body orbiting around the Earth. Right. It's a body, right? It's something that's orbiting something else, being more specific. Okay? So we think of a satellite as an instrument that's orbiting the Earth. Right? And if you look at the picture here on the left, it shows just some of NASA satellites that are used to study the Earth. Okay? But it can be a moon, a planet, or a machine. Okay? So in a sense, we are a satellite that orbits our sun, the star. Okay? Now can anybody tell me what is this picture on the right? It's an old, old satellite. That's the first one. What is its name? Sputnik. Yes, very good. Sputnik, very good. So once Sputnik, Sputnik occurred, that's when we really uh, were interested in learning more about space, and that's how NASA came to be. Before it was NACA, and we were interested in aerodynamics, but once Sputnik uh, was launched, then we were interested in space, okay, that S in NASA. Okay? So we're very proud of that because I'm talking to you from the mothership, the very first of the NASA centers, NASA Langley in Hampton, Virginia, just a few, just very close, just a little bit north of where the Wright brothers did their first flight. So there's a lot of uh, interesting um, history about that. Okay? And satellites are very important, okay? Um, if you think of it, we can only look at certain things with our eyes. Right? And if we use binoculars, we can look a little bit more, but it's still a very shallow view. So satellites provide that bird's eye view from the top, and then we can see things in a wider perspective and really look at what's happening and what's coming towards us and what's going to our neighbors. Okay? So um, if we look at this picture, which you can use, you can obtain from using Google Earth. Every single dot there around the Earth, those are satellites. Okay. Now can somebody say, uh, tell me, what is something that you notice, maybe a pattern that you notice in the picture? They're like rings. That's right. They look like rings, right? You notice that there's some rings that are farther away than others, right? You kind of see a cluster right around the Earth and then some rings on the outside. So just by looking at that, you notice that some satellites are closer to the Earth than other satellites. Now, does anybody know how we call this? What is the difference between the satellites that are near to the Earth and those that are farther away? Are there any sixth grade teachers in the room? In any of the rooms? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, I know this is part of sixth grade science. So there are different 
orbits that the satellites take. I want to give you little hints but not give it away. And that has to do with the distance element. Any guesses? Okay, do all, um, I'm trying to give you some more clues, let's see. Do all satellites move around and take pictures of different places or are there some satellites that stay in one place? Some are geosynchronized. <laughs> I know that's a sixth grade word, right? Yay! It doesn't that make sense that that's a sixth grade word? <laughs> so very good, very good. So there's different um, orbits, right? Which is what Bonnie, the word that Bonnie used, right? And they're used for different reasons, okay? So let's look at it a little bit more. We have the polar orbiting satellites, okay, which go around the Earth and kind of look, um, kind of pass through the poles or above the poles. Okay? And the picture on the left shows you the distance. So about 500 miles away from the Earth are these satellites. And then the picture on the right kind of shows you how it's scanning. Okay, so the idea with this is that if you notice these bands of colors, that's the data that's collecting. And the idea is to try and get as much data around the world as fast as possible. Okay, so as we're as we're as it's collecting data, it can learn about what's happening on the earth in more or less the same amount of time. So it might take a day um, or a few half a day, I believe, to go around the earth more or less once. Okay, and then as, as more and more it passes around, it'll fill those gaps that right now you see. Okay, so we can look at the entire Earth. So one of the big things that NASA has, NASA has polar orbiting satellites, which we saw a few in the picture before. We also have what's called the A-train satellite, and the A is for afternoon, because that's when they go above the U.S. And the idea with the A-train satellite is that satellites follow each other, each other kind of like a train. Okay, so then you have you have each satellite following each other, but then in each satellite, on aboard each satellite, there's different instruments that are focusing on different aspects of the Earth's system. So in a sense, one is is following the other more or less by 10 minutes. So we're looking at what's happening to the Earth's system in more or less the same time. So let's say Aqua is looking at the, at the water. So it's understanding what's happening with the water. Calypso is looking at the clouds and the aerosols. Cloudsat is looking at the clouds and the clouds type and um, um, dipping into the clouds. Parasol is looking at the aerosols again, but in a different aspect. So by looking at this, and having satellites just go through the same spot or almost at the same time, we can get a more perspective at that Earth system, at the system, by to better understand the climate. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Now there's other types of satellites, which are the geostationary satellites. Okay, so let's look at these. So geostationary satellites are farther away. Okay, so geostationary satellites are about 22,000 miles away. Okay, remember the polar orbiting satellites were about 500 miles away from the Earth. These are 22. 100 miles away from the Earth. And the essence is that as it moves and the Earth rotates, they're going to be looking at that same spot. Okay, so here are some really good uh, GIFs that I got from the Wikipedia page, which kind of illustrate that as the Earth moves, the satellite will move at the same 
rotation speed, basically. So it's always looking at the same spot on Earth. Okay. So we talked about the benefits of having polar orbiting satellites. What do you think would be the benefits of having geostationary satellites? So always looking at the same spot on the Earth. Communications. Right, communication. Right, when we go on a road trip and we put our little Garmin or, or our little thing that tells us where to go, right, it uses the satellites, the geostationary satellites, and it'll probably use two or three, right, to figure out where you are and how to get you to the spot as fast as possible, right? Now, what other benefits could we get by looking at the same spot? How about NAVSAT or geo, uh, the, the navigational satellites? Did you hear me? I heard navigational satellites, but... Yeah, navigational satellites, uh, NAVSAT, I think you used to call them, or something like that. Right, right. And it, it kind of gets, again, to communications, right? So you're figuring out locations. I'll show you a picture of another benefit, okay? So what about this? This is the cyclone Haiyan that just hit the Philippines. Okay. Do you think we would have known about the cyclone if it weren't for satellites? Not really, right? Because we do have a number of stations all around the country, right, in the U.S. and other countries um, have similar things, but they're on land, right? And we do have buoys that collect data, but they're far in between, right? So satellites really give us a perspective, and by always looking at the same spot, we know if something is coming, right? Because if we're constantly moving, we won't have that, um, we won't be able to see if something is coming or not until a few days later when we run into the same spot. By looking at that same spot, we can notice changes, right? And just by looking at the clouds there, you can notice that that storm is developing, right? So that's a huge benefit is in meteorology. And if you think, that will also relate to safety, our own safety, right? If we cannot look in the Atlantic, here, we're here in Hampton, Virginia. We cannot look in at the Atlantic. We won't know if a hurricane will be coming, right? So imagine um, having to help people, um, evacuations, and things like that. You, it's a real good benefit to know what's going to happen. Okay? Now, NASA is using their um, polar orbiting satellites. We have satellites that notice change with time to look at to help with uh, disaster response. So here this is uh, one of the satellites that's looking at change with time and it was used to look at the hardest spots that were hit due to the typhoon. And this will um, allow people to go to the areas that were largest hit before other areas. So kind of like trying to pinpoint where the people needed most help for this situation. Okay. The same thing with, um, with the tornado outbreak that just occurred. Okay. If we weren't looking at the same spot, the meteorologists would not be able to predict and send out warnings. Okay. And here on the left picture I have the projected, the warnings that were put out, and in the bottom is all the reports, the red ones being tornado reports. Okay, so these geostationary satellites are a huge benefit. Okay. So, are there any questions so far? Because I'm going to do an activity with you guys, and I want you guys to be talking, 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 okay? Are you guys ready? Do you need to stretch a little bit? Let's see. Okay. 
I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to show you a picture. And I want you to oh, tell me. We actually me. have one oh, question. I see you stretching in the background. I, I like it in Mecklenburg. I like it in Mecklenburg. Okay. So, Erica, go ahead with your question. So, Erica, go ahead with your question. Um, yes, when uh, meteorologists make reference to um, European models versus other models of uh, meteorology, are they referring to different satellites? So how, how do meteorologists combine satellites with model data? So, you know, the uh, European model projects that a storm will get to hit the roads, um, at, you know, at a certain time versus another model. Um, are, they, are they getting their data from different satellites or are they just making different predictions? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, so how, how projections are done is actually with um, station data. So at each National Weather Center, National Weather Service Center, there's an ASOS system, A-S-O-S, which has a slew, um, a variety of instruments. Okay? That's where we look at precipitation, wind, pressure. We also release the ray wind sounds or the radio sounds, right, the weather balloons. So all that pinpoint data is then collected and put together, and that's what's um, put into the models. Okay, so when you run a forecast model, you run, you look at, uh, you put in the data that you have, and then you run it a little bit, and then see what happens, and then you compare what it said that would happen with what's happening, right? So you look at it in a few hours, and then compare it, and that gives you an idea of how good or how bad different areas are being projected by the model, each model, right? And then you project it out, and then you input data again 12 hours, and then you project it out. And that's why uh, it's really important to have supercomputers, right? Because we want to release, the National Weather Service wants to release this data as fast as possible and have all this analysis ready to be able to alert people if something is coming out, okay? So then the different models focus on different areas. Right, so we have the North American model, which focuses on North America, right? So Mexico and then the U.S. Right, we have the European model, which then focuses a little bit farther out. So the combination of both is really good, right? The European model will understand better, uh, bigger systems like hurricanes or these huge uh, cyclones that hit Portland, you know, that come from the ocean. And that's another good use of models, right? We see it, the models will tell you that maybe something will be developing over the ocean, right? And then with satellite, you can try and understand the structure of it, but we can't really see into it as if we were to release a weather balloon or something over land, okay? So that's the really interesting use of satellite data and model data to do forecasts, okay? So as you're looking at where the jet stream is and where the storms are forming and if there's moisture coming up or um, if a front is developing, right? You can all look at that by looking at, um, just looking at satellite data. You, we're trained, right? Um, I used to be a meteorologist. I used to study clouds and aerosols. So we're trained to be able to see that with our own eyes by looking at satellite data and then using the models to see what might happen. And then we run, we look at five different models, let's say, to see which one seems to do better and then what to expect. And then wait six hours, 12, hour, 12 hours from now, and then look at uh, what might happen. And I say six to 12 hours because you're trying to predict something that'll happen in three days, right? The, um, the forecast was put out a day before the events and as we get closer and closer to the events, you you're can be a bit more specific to the areas that really need to pay attention. As you can tell, you asked the right person that question, huh? <laughs>
<laughs> Marilei does have extensive meteorology experience. Um, so that was a really good question. And yes, basically what you were asking is are they using different satellites? And it's not so much that they're using different satellites. They're getting different data, but uh, there is a European model and an American model that is used to put the data into. So that's what they're referring to when they're asking, uh, when you hear them saying about the European model. So great question. So is everybody nice and stretched? Because I'm going to ask you a question now, and I want you guys to be very interactive with me. Okay. So let's look at this picture, and you guys tell me what do you think we're looking at? And there's no right answers, so don't feel pressured. But so do feel do pressure to answer. We need guesses, right? <laughs> Yeah, so please the answer, but any guess? Stadium seats. A satellite solar panel. Okay, so solar panel. What was the first one? Was it Monica? A stadium seats or a rooftop. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Stadium seats, I like that. Okay, so let's look. All that I'm gonna do is just zoom out a little bit. Okay, so it, we're still looking at the same thing. We just zoomed out a little bit. So what do you think we're looking at now? Do you think it's still solar panels or stadium seats? I think you've stumped think the Marilei. <laughs> Apartment windows. Apartment windows. Apartment yeah. Windows. yeah. Sometimes people think that these are like, um, well, you can tell the age, kind of like photo negatives, right? <laughs> Kids won't really know that, but photo negative, okay? So let's just zoom out just a little bit more. Okay, so we're still looking at the same thing. We just zoomed out even more. A parking deck? A parking deck, okay. So now you're talking about a structure, kind of like a building, right? Any other guesses? A really big game of Jenga. <laughs> a game of Jenga. I would love that, huh? So both and both uh, selections actually make uh, alludes to buildings, right? So when we zoom completely out, that's what we were looking at. Okay, so it's a whole city that we were looking at, but you get different information by zooming in or by zooming out. Okay, so this is a really cool activity. It's in the Sally Ride Earth Cam. It's called Too Close for Comfort. And you have three sets of cards that you can just print and give them to your kids. And as a group, they can have either the city, the elephant, or the spider. Okay, and they have to flip each one whenever you tell them to. Okay, and try and guess what they're looking at. So you're getting into um, having them think, hypothesize, and then write down what they think they, um, they see. Okay? So the idea is that there's benefits to both views, the zoomed in and the zoomed out. Okay? We need both views, kind of like how we were talking about 
forecasting, meteorology, you need both in order to have the whole picture. Okay, so earlier before we were talking about using uh, Google Earth to look at the site that you picked for your uh, school, for the park, right? And then you can zoom out. Well, um, just recently there was a release of Landsat data, and Landsat looks at changes with time. Okay, we just celebrated about almost 20 years or 30 years with Landsat. So you can go to this website and look at Landsat images. Oops. Sorry about that. While Marilee is going to the site, let's just, uh, with a show of hands, how many of you teach change over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That runs through a lot of grade levels. Right. Um, so let's go to the website. The so what it is is um, Google has put together Landsat images of different parts of the world since 1984 to today. Okay? So then you can look at change over time for these different areas. And if you notice by this intro video, you can focus on different aspects of the Earth system. Okay? Now there's, a, there's, a, there's also the option of putting your own location. Okay? So when you and here in the bottom, there's a few high, uh, highlights, which is what it's showing. Right now it's the Amazon. And then the next one would be Las Vegas, where you can see the water, right? The amount of water changing and then the city growing. But at, in the last one, you can write your location and look at how it's changed with time. Okay, so if I put here the zip code around us, you can then go in and then look at change over time. So since 1984 to today. Okay, and then you can zoom in even more. Okay, so then you can see how things have changed around that part. And then if you tie it into the kids asking questions to maybe neighbors or family members of how they perceive the change, they can tie it in. So now they're doing research, you're integrating the language of asking questions and maybe taking a journal, and then they can do a presentation at the end of the scientific data that they got with the satellite data that they're using and then the stories from their family or um, neighbors as well. So this is my presentation of zooming out, the importance of zooming in and zooming out. So I'll pass it to Bonnie. All right, thank you, Marilee. And um, I want to, if there are any questions at the sites, I want to take those. But I want to show you one other quick resource while you're formulating your questions. Let's see if I can share. There we go. So uh, during Earth Week, I hope you are aware that recently we had Earth Week, and uh, one of the resources that NASA put together for Earth Week was called Images and Data. You just saw the book flashing there on the website, and it involved mapping our world. So down the side here, over on the left side of the page, there are wonderful resources to click on and go to. And this resource here, the interactive, allows you to mouse over the world and see which satellites are collecting what kind of data. So each little tile on this mosaic gives you information about a different kind of data. I saw GRACE somewhere. I was looking for that one um, because GRACE is a very interesting satellite studying water movement around the Earth. So that's one that you might use um, as you're studying the different uh, Earth system science elements. There it is. And when you click in here, oops, I'm not going to do that, but when you click again, you learn more about the data set and the mission itself. So that's a really valuable resource to be able to use.
So let me go back here and stop sharing. Are there any other questions at the site? All right, and I'm going to use appropriate wait time as a teacher here and get any other questions you have. And what I'm going to finally display is all of the links that we used for the different resources that we shared today. And Marilei, will you look and see if there are any uh, questions that came in via Twitter or the comment box? And in the meantime, I will display all of the links. Um, you don't if. You can certainly try and write these down. I've provided them to the sites that are connected, so you will have that to take with you. Uh, but remember, this recording will live on YouTube. So you will be able to go on to YouTube and uh, actually see the end of this recording and be able to get the links from there. All right, so any questions before we close from the site? So, Bonnie, in the, in the Twitter feed, we haven't had any questions. I okay. just suggest, can you make it bigger? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yep, I'm no not problem. looking at it, yes. Bonnie? Yes. One question on schedule. You had said that this series would continue third Thursday of every month. Correct. Which is pretty much the same as the previous one, except the previous one omitted December. Are we now including December? That is correct. Yes, we Thank are you. including December, and uh, that's a great way to close. Thank you, Bob. Actually, I'm not sure if that was Bob or Bill, but <laughs> so the <laughs> they they tag team there, and I can't tell them apart. Um, the next session will be December 19th, and the December 19th session will be the topic will be Green Ninja, a super. Uh, what is it? A, a climate, a super action hero uh, that teaches kids about how to deal with climate change and actions that they can take. So, oh, I made that too big. I'm trying to make this bigger for you. Uh, while I'm there, we go. Let me share this now. So, Bonnie, so that will be our December session. Yes. Somebody, we just got a question from Bob the Uncle. Okay. Twitter. All right. <laughs> he said, right. "How how would you recommend that teachers explain the why?" of climate science. The why of climate science? Is that the question? Am I understanding that correctly? Mm -hmm. So I, I think what he's trying to say is that why is it important to study the climate? Okay. So uh, what comes to mind, and Marilee, I'll let you answer as well, but what comes to mind is looking at what's happening around you. So uh, as we discussed those phenology changes, how the changes in the climate are affecting the ecosystems that are part of the areas uh, in, e in each school district or, or each school. So that might be a way to study that. And um, the why could also be why is it happening and in that case you'd want to study the different elements of climate science and earth system science that we're collecting data on that could indicate why we're seeing the changes that we're seeing, rises in temperature, you know, whatever the different variable may be. Did you have something to add, Marilei, on that? Well, I'm thinking also a little bit big, right? The, um, the MAVEN instrument just launched on Monday, and MAVEN is going to look at Mars and Mars atmosphere and kind of trying to figure out with the Curiosity rover if Mars is more a picture of how Earth used to be or a prognostic of how Earth will be, right? So it's also studying kind of relating how things change and how does, does that affect us and also other planets as we're studying our neighbor planets as well and what we can learn from other planets um, to better understand our own planet. Hi, Bonnie. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Oh. Um, can you post all of these links to the NICE website? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, the reason is there's not a place there that um, 
I'll, I'll look into that. But there's not a place where they're actually uh, the resources for each one of these sessions will be posted. But you have the links to distribute at the people at your for the people at your site, Erica. Yes, I, um, Monica was asking if we could do that. Right. Your right. best bet would be finding uh, the video. As I said, it's posted on YouTube and at the end of the video because we're still live, so these links will be there. And Nick, I'm going to uh, end the live broadcast at this point. We already went five minutes over. We'll stay connected to the, the sites that are with us, and if you have additional questions, uh, we can answer those. And I will look into posting these. We'll need to do some work with the website to be able to do that. Um, go ahead, Marilei. Yeah, and um, I was just indicated that we could post the links on the YouTube archive presentation as mm -hmm. well. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it was this group. I've talked about Ask Nice so much today that I'm kind of <laughs> getting things blurred. But we're looking into creating an asynchronous uh, 